Lavinia, and this is episode 287 of At Percussion. With me, as usual today, our co-host, Ben Charles. Hey, Carly, how are you? Hey, Ben, I'm good. I have to know, how many cakes did you bake this week? <laughs> I think just, I think one. Only, only, but was that the, <laughs> just one. Was that the beautiful one for your nephew? Yeah, this is the, uh, the kid's birthday cake with the, the racing theme. Um, which for the longest time I heard how much wedding cakes cost. And I was like, that's ridiculous. But now having made like complicated cakes, I totally get it. Well, that was like on par with wedding cake level intricacy. I mean, it didn't look like a wedding cake, of course, but. Yeah, it was, uh, it was very time, time involved. It's a, definitely a semester's over project, not a heat of the semester project. Some people bike 27 miles and other people <laughs> bake beautiful cakes. So I say it's a competitive cake, Ben. Like I've showed it to friends and they've, <laughs> I said, this has been on the podcast. They said like he could compete. So yeah, we're, you should think about it. Nice. Um, also here today, of course, is Ksenia Kumjanovic. Hey, Carly, I didn't bake or bike, which is why the mortality rate is where it's supposed to be right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> No, but you did this Valley Percussion Festival thing yesterday. Tell us about that. How'd it go? I did. I did. Uh, well, it has been an exciting event. Luckily, I uh, and many of us were offered to pre-record everything. So I did a lot of editing and made myself look like a little YouTuber with pop-ups and so on, trying to be funny and interrupting myself constantly. Um, but it was, it was good. I think the highlight of that is that... Um, my name was next to Steve Gads, so I think I can retire now. I have no idea if he's actually doing a clinic or they just put him there as bait, but I was just like, oh my God, there's my name and then like four names up and one name to the right is Steve Gadd. I've made it. <laughs> because Steve Gadd is an avid podcast listener, just wanted to take the chance. Hey, Steve, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> we love you, man. <laughs> nice, nice. And last but not least, of course, Casey Cangelosi is here too. Casey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going, everybody? Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, did you do any yard work this weekend? No, zero. No. Zero. Took a break. <laughs> That's good. That's healthy. That's good. Um, all right. Well, we're recording this episode on May 16th, but if you're listening on our release day, it'll be June 3rd. So, Casey, what happened today in history? Um, oops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Are you serious? I, I was like so. panic checking for this. Like, it wasn't me today, right? <laughs> oh, there it is. There it is. Um, Just make up something obscure. We'll never know. Yeah. Okay. So instead of researching this day in history, I blew that off and I put all the work on Ksenia to give away some mallets on our Instagram page. So Ksenia, you did that drawing and we had a bunch of entries and I think we have mallets to give away, right? Yes, we have your beautiful mallets to give away. And if I might be granted some screen sharing, which I do have, ooh, privileges, let me show you. You're going to witness this. So all of our folks are in there. We've set this. I'm on the magichatnamepicker.com, by the way. And now we're going to find out who gets these gorgeous mallets. And a one, and a two, and a... Pedro Castro, Pedro. Pedro Castro, perk on Instagram. Congratulations, Pedro. You got to yourself a set, a huge set of beautiful mallets. Thank you, IP. Thank you, Casey. Sure. This is exciting. You need to contact us and we need to get your info so we can ship them to you by an owl or whatever Casey likes to use from his good old. Yeah, send us, your, send us your mailing address. You can send it to uh, Ksenia through Instagram or if you want to track us down on Facebook. There's uh, lots of contact info uh, on all those social media platforms. So, yep, let us know and we'll get you your mallets. Thanks for playing. Nice. Yeah, thanks to everybody who commented and shared and follows our page because that's awesome. That's wonderful. All right. Well, without further ado, um, I'd, I'm happy to introduce our guest today, Matt Jordan. Um, Dr. Matt Jordan currently serves as assistant professor of percussion at Jacksonville State University in Jacksonville, Alabama. He's also the front ensemble arrangement for Music City Mystique, the music coordinator and sound designer for the Blue Coats Drum and Bugle Corps, and the front ensemble arranger and sound designer for the Commandments' own United States Marine Drum and Bugle Corps. 
also a music advisor for the Colts Drum and Bugle Corps. Um, so he's very, very busy. Prior to starting <laughs> at Jacksonville State, Matt was the concert percussion marketing manager for Pearl Adams um, and the assistant band director and instructor of percussion at Middle Tennessee State University. So welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, so can I just add Matt. something to, can I just add something about Matt's bio? Matt was a was a master's student at UNT when I was an undergraduate student. And you know how like sometimes you meet people that can just do everything? Like they can play timpani, they can play marimba, they can play snare drum, they can play drum set, they can arrange, they can do that's Matt Jordan, like ridiculous. <laughs> Made all of us look very, very bad. So I think uh Brian Nosny said something like that about Diana Loomer, and uh Matt definitely falls into that category as well. So good to see you, Matt. You as well, Ben, and I'll send you that $20 bill, I promise you, for that comment, so. <laughs> nice, thanks, Ben. I thought we'd start off, Matt, tell us a little bit about what what's what it's been like at JSU during the pandemic. Are, are you finishing with the school year? Is everything over? Yeah, so we were lucky. Our semesters start pretty early, so we were actually done with uh, kind of classes uh, end of April. So I've had a few weeks off at this point, uh, which has been very, very nice. They were still finishing up finals, but none of the classes that I teach have finals. Um, so we were we were done a little early on the applied side of things uh, within that. But overall this year, um, we actually moved into a new music building uh, or a newly renovated music building uh, in the fall. So not only were you figuring out how to deal with the pandemic, you were also having to learn how to use the new building and kind of make that work within that as well. Um, it was really nice for us uh, overall, um, all things considered. Uh, we percussion wise were able to stay relatively um, normal aside from a little bit of documentation of practice room usage and you know airing out of practice rooms between um, but we were able to mostly stay pretty normal just wearing masks and distancing uh, with percussion ensemble and things like that uh, the biggest difference for us was the concert bands didn't meet at all uh, either fall or spring um, so that was I know a big change with the students and the marching band which is such a huge part of our program here at JSU um, they they really didn't meet in any meaningful way they kind of did a pet band type of thing uh, for the fall so that 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 was the biggest difference I think from what the school's used to is having that big uh, full 550 person marching band in the fall wasn't really a thing um, so a little different on that but no overall it was it was a good experience and got some good projects done um, one of the things we did in the fall since we didn't do an in-person concert was a full-on recording project so uh, you know we taught the students how to use all the audio equipment all the video equipment they did all the recordings all the editing um, to, to put together an entire virtual concert and got them the kind of experience of the recording studio environment more so than the live performance environment which is a, a good little uh, change of pace for i think for the students yeah, I feel like this whole this whole school year, like we all need to debrief now, like, OK, we made it through and let me share what weird stuff did you do and what worked? And we're hearing a lot of, you know, students getting much better at recording and, you know, understanding how to use the equipment and software and all of that. So that's really nice. Thanks for telling us a little bit about that. Um, ben, I think you have something next. Yeah, well, Matt, I just I kind of like joked about this in the intro, but um, I know that after your college, you you worked full time for Pearl Adams, um, and we had Sean LaFrenz on the podcast maybe a couple months ago at this point, and and he talked about some of the sort of qualifications of what a company like Pearl would be looking for in an employee. And it seems like in percussion or just music in general, we get on such distinct tracks. Like I'm training to be an orchestral musician, I'm training to work in the industry, I'm training to be a college professor. And if I were to just look at you and what I know of you, I would say, oh, that guy's going for a college professor job. And then you landed this Pearl Adams thing. And I know one of the things that I can't remember, it might have been Sean told me about you is like you were able to demonstrate all the instruments so well. And that's such a valuable skill. So uh, could you tell us about how your training was broad enough to cover you for these different career paths that you've been down? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think the important thing is that I've been a gear nerd my entire life. Anybody who uh, was in school with me or March Drum Corps with me or anything like that, my nickname at Cavaliers was MacGyver. Like I've always been the person that really uh, was known for kind of finding the way to kind of make something work or, you know, take apart, take a piece and fix something else. 
Um, so a lot of that was just me growing up kind of with that type of mentality um, all the way through school. Um, and so it was really nice kind of jumping into the Pearl job where I already had experience with the Pearl and Adam stuff through um, Music City Mystique, through uh, my time at MTSU, which, which Lala was a Pearl artist and all of our gear was, was Pearl. And then FSU at the time, Parks was a, a Pearl artist as well. So a lot of my time in school and in drum corps and WGI groups was with the Pearl equipment. So like when I get to Pearl, it took me zero training to be able to kind of deal with the instruments and deal with the equipment because uh, I was already really uh, kind of adept at that. Uh, another thing that was helpful is my dad's actually a professional woodworker. Um, and so a lot of the things I kind of grew up with were dealing with, you know, wood and caring for equipment um, and, and those type of more handy type of skills. Um, and that really kind of helped be able to jump into those type of things um, with, within that. Um, but in terms of just general kind of well-roundedness, um, that was always kind of my goal um, is to be a little bit of a chameleon, be able to kind of do anything that I got called for, especially living in Nashville. And actually, I'm going to correct Ben's statement a little bit. The one thing that I would not say that I sound professional on or would feel comfortable taking a real high level gig is drum set. Um, and a lot of that living in Nashville and growing up in Nashville, there's such a big, heavy drum set saturation uh, where the people who do drum set here in Nashville, that's all they do. And they spend all their time and all their energy doing that. So it was my goal living in Nashville to be able to play everything else that they couldn't play. Um, so that was my focus is, you know, rather than trying to be a mediocre drum set player, uh, which I, I can still, you know, hold my own if I have to, um, but I wouldn't consider myself an expert like I feel on a lot you're, of the other instruments. You're a better drum set player than I would say most timpanists that I've heard. <laughs> I'll put it that way. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Um, so a lot of that was through school. My goal was to be well-rounded and even like everyone sees me as this kind of drum corps marching person now at a certain level. And uh, I actually only really marched those activities because in high school, my high school did not have a high school marching band at all. Um, and so I actually was marching Mystique and some of these groups just because they were local in Nashville and a way for me to kind of get out and do something that was percussion related. Um, and that just kind of led me into marching drum corps, but I actually didn't even, I didn't march my last two years of drum corps, my last three years of indoor, um, because I started focusing on the concert percussion side of things. Um, so I, I ended up doing the Steven seminar. I ended up doing the Duff Timpani seminar a few years at the Eastern Music Festival. Um, so my goal was to try to be a little bit more well-rounded with the orchestral stuff. And then I just somehow got roped back into teaching the drum corps world and here I am now. So, uh, but that was never my, my ultimate goal is to be somebody doing stuff in the marching activity at all, actually. Well, let's back up just for a second, because you mentioned and kind of glossed over that your dad is a woodworker. Has, yeah. he, has he made any awesome percussion stuff? Uh, so not really. So he, um, how do I describe this? My, my dad, uh, so he's very high end artist, like has pieces in the Smithsonian, pieces in the White House. Um, like really, really high end woodworker. Um, and so he's helped me with some product or projects and things like that, but he hasn't made me anything specifically, uh, or anything like that. Um, so what's yeah. his, what's his name? Can we see his work? If I Google yeah. him? Yeah. Find if you, if you look at John Jordan, um, okay. you can see his work. Um, it's, yeah, it's Ooh. beautiful, beautiful work. Um, and it was cool. really funny. I kind of grew up with my dad, um, he, being a freelance artist, kind of like what I do with all the marching, arranging and all that stuff now. Um, but I never really thought I had a ton in common with my dad. Um, and that now all of a sudden kind of living the professional career life, you see that it's entirely stuff you have in common with the way that you know, trade shows and the way that it works with going to seminars and conventions and, you know, going and traveling internationally for business. Like it's it's all the same stuff. It's like wooden pottery. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Is that what is that what wood turning is? So like you're you're you work with wood, but on a on a um, on a um, lathe. A yeah. Lathe. Yeah. Lathe. Yeah. Um, wow. So, yeah, most of his work is with lathes. Um, he does some stuff with hand carving as well on top of that. But usually it's a lathed piece that's then carved by hand as well. So I hate it when your dad is better at stuff than you are. I have that same I, problem. Like I suffer from that also. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I was just. Uh, no, but this. This Relatable. artwork is is wonderful. I mean, yeah. Yeah, go check out the website. And he, I mean, it says that he is part of public collections. I mean, everywhere from yeah, international. Like, yeah. crazy. Wow. Congrats. Thanks. He's, he's <laughs> Congrats awesome. Congrats on so. picking your dad. That was pretty good. <laughs> good job. Yeah, that's funny. 
Good so, job. But it's, it's one of those weird parallels of like, you think about like in our world, signature mallets or signature instruments and stuff like that. Well, my dad has a signature lathe, you know? Um, wow. So, yeah. Wow. Again, one of those things that you kind of don't think about until you know it ha- know it's there. So is it um sorry i'm like hijacking this topic a little bit but like what's what's it like talking with him about art and music like i feel like my, my dad's a mathematician but we we seem to merge the two a lot in conversation like there seems to be i, I don't know like without making them make a relationship it's still easy to talk about both of them but i imagine the connections uh even a little closer because your dad's a you know a, a, a textbook artist yeah, it, it is. And um, he actually does play a little bit of music as well. He actually is a really killer harmonica player, not professionally, just kind of just for fun. Um, but yeah, it's fun hearing him play harmonica occasionally. Um, but he's definitely more enjoys that more kind of uh, folk um, kind of style music. But yeah, we we'll really enjoy coming and seeing an orchestra concert and things like that. Um, actually, uh, funny enough, and my on my other side of the family, my uncle is actually the tuba player for the Nashville Symphony. Um, so I actually have on my mom's side, musicians kind of historically as well. Um, so that's a lot of where the music part of my family comes from is my mom's side. In addition to that. Very cool. That's so cool. There must be so many just skills and kind of characteristics and qualities that you have that you share with your dad that, you know, just help you out in both, in both areas. I think my dad was a chemical engineer and. I don't know if you can get much further from like percussionist and teacher, um, but I know I recognize now, like looking back on his life and thinking about so many of the skills that made him good at his job, I feel help me do better at my job. So I don't totally. know, all these things, they come together. Um, well, Matt, I wanted to ask you while we're talking about Pearl Adams a little bit, um, were, were there what were some of the biggest takeaways um, that you got from working there that maybe influenced you or have influenced you as a performer, or as an educator? You know, are there things that you learned about marketing or, you know, products in general? Yeah, um, I, I think the biggest thing that I was able to gain from my experience at Pearl was like, I got to be close with a lot of really amazing artists. Um, and so just kind of getting that kind of one on one time with so many, I mean, like spending time with like Cynthia A with Chicago, you know, Mark Damalakis in Cleveland, like like uh, Ed Stefan in San Francisco, like you just get to go hang out with these people. And it's your job to go hang out with them. And, you know, yes, talk business a little bit, but also just be a person and, you know, be a colleague. Um, so I think the biggest thing I gained was just the kind of the experience dealing with those people in the kind of greater, um, especially the orchestral community. Um, it's just fun to kind of consider that some of those people as kind of friends and colleagues now that beforehand, you know, you come into the industry, you come in uh, as a student thinking that all of these people are on this big pedestal, um, you know, and that they're these people that aren't just normal people, they do these crazy things, but then you get to hang out with them and they're, you know, they like talking about golf and bikes and, you know, other things as well. Um, so it's fun kind of getting to know people on a different level, uh, kind of within that where you don't when, when you just run into somebody at PASIC, you just don't get that, you know, you, you generally don't have enough time to kind of get to know somebody w- well, like spending three days with them over a weekend uh, within that. Um, so yeah, that that was, I think, the biggest takeaway was just kind of that experience of, of doing that. Um, additionally, I mean, some of the marketing stuff uh, that absolutely helped because I don't absolutely don't have a marketing background. And it's really weird with the way the Pearl job is and that like the name of the Pearl job as concert percussion marketing manager, but more in practicality, it was more an artist relations and product development position. Um, So a lot of it was really the artist relations side and also just seeing how a product gets developed from like the idea of the inception of the idea of the product all the way through the kind of market research and figuring out the market positioning of where a product would be. You know, is this something because there's a lot of things that you come up with that like, man, it'd be awesome for that to be a product. And then you kind of work out the pricing and all those type of things. And you realize that you just can't physically make it for the price that somebody would pay for it. Um, so that, that I think was one of the most interesting things is coming up with some of those ideas that you you all think it's a great idea until you realize that it's going to cost $300 for a wing nut. You know, um, we have we have a lot of ideas. <laughs> on this show. A vibraphone, Higher. a battery for the motor. That's right. Like plug it in and charge it, but then you bring it on stage. You don't have to plug it in. Let's, let's, yeah, let's pitch that to Matt. What do you think of that, Matt? I, I think that's a great idea. Now look, yeah. awesome. what if, now look, the battery is going to die though, right? So no, but it's like a laptop. Mod- you can use it plugged in and then unplug it just seamlessly. 
So it's a li- you mean it's a lithium chargeable battery bank? Yeah, royalty free. Any percussion company that wants it. Hey, what if you had a crank and the the fan was a spring tension? So all you had to do is crank it, and it it never ran out of battery. Better than Ben. Another idea: a foot powered snare throw off for bar talk. <laughs> Right. Yes. <laughs> I think I think Kohlberg sells one of those, but it's about eight grand. So uh, yeah, it's not yeah. Kohlberg pricing. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how many times I pitched those ideas on the podcast, and still, after like five years, no one's taken us up on them. Yeah, I know. Every yeah, time, every time, I feel like I hear that on every episode. It's a bit of deja vu. <laughs> Keep pitching it though, because someday, someday, the percussion world will thank you. Yeah. Right. Well, and I'll uh, get like- Matt's. I'll get Matt's dad to make that out of wood. There you go. Yeah, yeah. But like a good example of like the product development cycle that was really interesting was like everyone knows those multi base legs that we ended up coming out with when I was there. Like they look so simple and it looks like one of those things that just like, oh, that makes sense. Why didn't somebody make that before? Well, like that was actually the ninth different idea or iteration for that product. And so like going from the idea of like you start with this big basket style thing that was like super unwieldy and nobody would ever use and you kind of just go through iteration after iteration to the point where you get to something that's like oh that's so simple like of course that's the right answer um and so it's it's fun kind of going through that process um getting patents i mean i i don't you know there's there's not many people out there with your college resume having patents on there you know your college cv it's very interesting to have that on my cv with you know inventions and things like that yeah yeah what do you have a patent on is it the legs they the multi-base legs yeah it's me oh. and sean have a have a patent for that doesn't so. another company have legs like that too yeah yeah so how do they get around your patent we're not naming anybody yeah. sabian <laughs> just kidding it's not sabian <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I'm, even though I was, my name's on the patent, I'm not in charge of, I was not in charge of doing anything related to enforcing that. So, uh, I, uh, I have no idea why that, happened. how they, how they got. Yeah. Around. And I'm sure, I'm sure they found, because that's the whole thing with patents is like, you find ways of being creative in, you know, using a slightly different method of attachment in order to get around the way that the patent is written. Um, yeah, it's yeah. it's a whole it's a whole world of patents and you know uh, how you write them in order to kind of cover can the you, broadest way. So can you can you patent like the usage like so it's not so much the mechanics or the mechanism or like this wing nuts connected here and and so they're going to connect it down here and thus it's different. But it's like well the thing I'm patenting patenting I can't say that patenting is the <laughs> usage like I it's the invention of the use of like hey we're going to take a make legs for a bass drum so that multi setups are are easier. I think the implementation is pretty much what you can patent. I mean, I think that that you're explaining what you're doing through the implementation. Um, uh-huh. And so I think that the patent, I think the way that it was patented, which again, I didn't write, but you hire way, you know, law, fancy lawyers that know how to write patent speak to do it. But I know we wrote it in a way that covered a few different uses. I don't honestly know if we, the way that it was written covered the other competing product. I'll say it that right. way. Right. So. Zildjian. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, the name calling. <laughs> um, Matt, I don't know if you can answer this question, but I ha- I know nothing about patents. Does this mean that A, you get like a million dollars checks every uh, every month? No, no, unfortunately not. So, that, so what's uh, the pay like? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the patents don't work that way. Um, it's really just to protect you within that. Um, and we were listed as the inventors, but because, and this is how most companies work. Like if I worked for Tesla, if I worked for Apple, if I did work that then uh, was used in a vehicle, like it's part of my job because they're paying me a salary to do that. So even though I'm, my name is listed as the inventor, the reason I was able to invent that is I had the resources of a company like that behind me to do it. So usually you, you're getting the credit for it, but you're not actually getting royalties or anything like that off of a product like that, typically. Um, if you're working for a company when you do it, if I were to invent that as a private citizen and then pitch it to Pearl, maybe that would be a different situation. Um, but since I was working there, that was just part of our normal job responsibilities is coming up with new products. And that has happened to be a different enough one to warrant a patent. But your name's on it, right? So you're credited with it? Yeah, it's on the patent. So so on the actually, patent. got it. Yeah, it's on the patent. So it's it's go, not, yeah, not a signature set of bass drum legs or anything like that, but it, it, cool. it is on the patent. So that's cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's that's cool. Uh, and that, sorry, again, patent, I'm, I'm silly, but um, is that completely prohibitive when you patent something? Is it, can you say, like, check the box that, oh, I'm okay with other people using this as long as I'm 
credited sometimes in the process. It's like, I made this up, nobody else make money off. Um, well, that, I don't know if it works with actual patents, but I know that there's a type of licensing called Creative Commons that I know a lot of kind of digital files use. Um, so I'm assuming with the patents, there's those same type of open source patents um, that you can set up. I don't know how that's documented. Again, I, I, I wish I knew more about that, but I don't, so. I'll let you know when I patent the, the battery powered vibraphone yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Royalty free. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to butcher this story, but there's that uh, Netflix series called The Toys That Made Us. And it's something like the guy that invented like G.I. Joe or Barbie, like they either said like, we'll pay you a million dollars or one dollar on each one that's sold. And he picked like the million dollars and would have made like so much more with the uh, the other one. But um, Anyway, changing changing topics a bit, Matt, uh, we had a couple of Instagram questions from Shane Roderick, uh, one of which was actually, I didn't realize I sort of stole Shane's question, was how do you balance your various positions in the percussive arts? Uh, but he also asked, what are some challenges you face working with multiple groups? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll add, because I didn't really cover the first one in, in depth. Um, that is a big challenge, um, because it's one of those things that since I do a lot of different things in a lot of different worlds, like. I've had to get really good at the word no, um, because it's one of those things that you can get stretched too thin, and especially when it's in different avenues. I mean, one of the main reasons that I left the Pearl job um, is not because I didn't enjoy the Pearl job. It's that a lot of my work outside of the music industry was things that happened in the summer, that, th that things that happened where I'm writing lots of marching band or drum corps music that happened in the summer. So um, I was having to take vacation time during the summer um, in order um, to go go hang out with Bluecoats or hang out with any of the groups I was working with. Um, and the problem was, is when my wife said like, hey, cool, let's take a vacation this summer. And I was like, well, I kind of used all my vacation time to go hang out with this drum corps all summer. Um, obviously creates an issue. Um, and so the, the, the college teaching lifestyle, tip, typically the schedule works a little bit better for those type of things. Um, so one of the things that I've done recently is just changing jobs to allow myself a little bit more uh, flexibility because really when I'm writing for Blue Coats, I'm writing from high school marching bands, because that's typically happening from like May through July, which luckily is when we're off with the university side. Same with when I'm writing for Mystique, that's going to be happening primarily in kind of December and January when I'm when I'm off for the Christmas break uh, side of things as well. So it just gives me a little bit more flexibility within that. Um, when I was living up in Nashville, um, it was difficult because there was weeks that I was uh, playing with Nashville Symphony, uh, so I'd have to take a week off of work from Pearl in order to go play with the Nashville Symphony. Uh, I was teaching adjunct uh, at MTSU at the same time. So students were actually coming to my house up in Nashville uh, to take lessons with me. Um, but it, you know, I could have taught more lessons, but I just kind of had to artificially limit it and say I can only teach four students. Um, just because I knew that if I did more than that, that I wouldn't see my wife and I wouldn't have time to actually do things that I enjoyed um, outside of those kind of career things. So a, a lot of it was just setting kind of artificial limits as what helped um kind of kind of that on the career change obviously helped a good bit too uh what was that second question ben it was uh how does working how do you balance working with multiple groups got it um that is um that's actually usually not too bad um i've been pretty smart to limit myself um in the number of groups i'm working with per season like i know a lot of the people who are more full-time arrangers that don't have a kind of a regular day job um like i do um they'll write for 10 15 20 uh high school marching bands and i write for four um, and so generally the, the seasons are separate enough that like in the indoor season, I'm usually only writing for Mystique. Um, the the uh, Marine Drum and Bugle Corps that I just started writing for two years ago, um, they only do the indoor drumline activity that just came out on that video, like maybe once every two or three years. Um, so that's not kind of a consistent every year thing for them. Uh, they only go when they're gonna be going to WGI. Um, and then for DCI, um, they will be going every year, but their, their kind of season and how it works overlaps. So like they are actually starting their season a lot earlier. So I can be writing for the Marines kind of in the, the late fall when I don't start writing for Blue Coats until the spring. Um, so overall, uh, none of the groups are really operating concurrently for the most part within that. And, and with the high schools that I write for, I'm not typically going in and working with them that often. I'm just writing the music for them. Um, so that makes it a little easier. I find it fascinating people that can write for e even just more than one group. I remember uh, when I was a student, and I'm guessing he's probably dialed it back a bit at this point, but Paul Rinnick said that he wrote for I think it was 90 or 100 groups a year, uh, which 
it's just insane. I mean, I'm sure he has his licks and he's there's maybe some copy and pasting and all, but still just like to go through just to sit and watch a hundred marching band shows would take hours upon hours. I can't imagine arranging for that. Yeah, I, it would absolutely be like, and for me, like, I feel like my creativity is limited a little bit and that like, I, I know that if I really wrote any more of the group than the groups that I do right now, I wouldn't enjoy it anymore. And therefore I wouldn't be doing things that I was really happy with or proud of. Um, and so like, that was one of the big question marks. Like when I knew I was going to leave the Pearl job just to cut, try to have more time to do other things. Like I was looking at the JSU job cause they had kind of offered that to me, but I was also looking at going freelance and, um, and just doing the arranging thing full time, like a lot of people have. Um, and I could have totally done that from a financial perspective. I just knew that I couldn't, I didn't see myself writing marching band music for 30 years. Um, and so I didn't see it being my long-term solution, even if it was a short-term solution. Um, so yeah, I, I, I totally you know a lot of people who do that kind of, maybe not 90, that's absurd, um, but like that do that kind of 20, 30 groups a season. Um, and, and you know what, they hate it, you know, but they, but they are good at it. And so they are able to kind of just churn it out and make it work. Um, I try to be a little bit more exclusive and do things that I feel like I can make really good and be really proud of. Um, because to me, it is supplemental income, you know, like the, you know, my, my university position is what is my main income. So anything I'm doing is, is I'm doing because I enjoy doing it and I enjoy working with these groups uh, first and foremost. Matt, here I'm the money person again, but for our friends in Europe and in Asia who maybe don't have this practice, and for me, this too is, is new, um, what, is, what does it mean? How much money do these arrangers make? Because we have no other, we have no parallel <laughs> in the percussion world, especially in Europe. I really don't know anyone who makes money besides from co composition, maybe. So what are, what are numbers? I'm sure that they vary, but what is sort of... Well, I mean, so if you're writing a, a, a book for a high school percussion section, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of make it a complete package. If you're writing for the battery and the front ensemble, if you're a beginning arranger, you might make $1,000 for both, um, you know, so, you know, and, and when I started out, I think when I wrote my first front ensemble book, I made $700 um, for, for writing for that season, um, for writing about eight to nine minutes worth of music within that. So it's pretty, you know, pretty good money, even for, a, especially for a college student aged person uh, within that. But like some of the bigger arrangers uh, that are kind of at the top of the activity can easily take in 10 to $15,000 for, uh, for a percussion book. Um, so, you, you know, if you're writing for five or six groups, you can make a full salary, but that's usually kind of the arrangers like Paul Rennick, I'm sure is, is in that kind of number range for a high school. I, I'm, I don't know that, and, and he might kill me if I say that, but I mean, like, realistically, those kind of level of rangers are probably making that from the upper level Texas, you know, BOA level high schools uh, when they're doing that. Isn't that ten to $15,000 range for a full percussion section within that? Um, drum corps, probably even more. Um, you know, there, I've heard numbers in the, uh, in the 20s and 30s um, to write a percussion book for, but that's also meaning you're in charge of that section too. So that's your teaching responsibilities that's your arranging it's not just the book uh within that um, but a lot of it's because a lot of these schools like the supply and demand of it you know they want to hire the arrangers that are being successful at the top of the activity but you know there's 2,000, 3,000 high schools in the US, I'm probably way underestimating. And so if if only a small percentage of them want to hire Paul Rennick or, you know, Tom Rarick or Tom Angst, like, you're going to have to pay for that exclusivity to get that person to write for you within that. So what would it take to get a new like lit? Like we've got the triplet that's old and done. We've got like the five lit that's really in right now. If we can get a new lit like that would really I feel like there's a lot of money there. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of innovation to be had on the lits. So, yeah. yeah Probably you can get a patent for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there man, you go. yeah. <laughs> well, Matt, I love what you were saying earlier about creating artificial limits. I haven't heard that term before, but it's exactly, you know, when somebody asks you, like, hey, do you have availability for lessons, you know, Saturday morning at 6 a.m.? Like, yes, but no, you right. know, you have to, yeah. you have to know how to say no. So I like that concept. I think I'm going to, I'm going to steal that and use that. <laughs> That's a wonderful thought. Um, but it brings me to the, the next question I wanted to ask you, which is kind of about um, balance of well-roundedness because you're just so active in different areas of percussion. And then also as a teacher, as a performer and all of this arranging that you're doing, 
Um, have there been points in your life and in, in your musical life and career that you've had to make kind of calculated decisions about what am I going to focus on now? Um, and then also, how do you address like the, the balance between well roundedness and specialization and how much to do of what with your students? Yeah, no, that's awesome question. Um, I think the the big thing for me with balance um, is uh, it started when I was in in uh, college because I was playing timpani for the Cavaliers. I was doing drum corps playing timpani, um, and a lot of it's because I just really enjoyed it. I, I really enjoyed the challenge of playing the difficult parts that the drum corps kind of world had that really I didn't see in the orchestra or band world. Um, so I just enjoyed doing it. I was a timpani nerd, um, but at a certain point in college, people started like thinking I was a timpanist and not a percussionist. And so I would really kind of get those kind of like assumptions of what I did. Um, and so for about two years, I tried to play zero timpani whatsoever. Um, it, not not for myself, but mainly to try to get rid of the kind of preconceived notions that other people had about what I was strong at. Um, and so that was, a, I think, a big uh, kind of starting point for me in that kind of idea of being well uh, well-rounded and balanced as a percussionist. Um, I always also wanted to always be the person that like, if there was a gig that didn't involve drum set, and if somebody called me for it, that I would be able to say yes, I wanted to have at least the basic set of skills to do everything and to sound remotely authentic. You know, I wanted, even if I didn't know everything about playing djembe, I at least wanted to sound good on a djembe. You know, I might not know every single style or every single kind of, uh, you know, uh, approach to the djembe, but I know that if, if somebody authentic heard me playing, they wouldn't be embarrassed about it. Um, you know, same with playing congas, bongos, um, all the hand percussion stuff. I always wanted to at least be able to sound authentic on the little, small, narrow thing that I knew how to do. Uh, within that. Um, and so that that actually kind of carried me well. Like um, one of the things that Lala was phenomenal at when I went to school at MTSU for my undergrad is the Latin percussion stuff. Um, so I really took that and ran with it. Um, you know, I, I kind of went into my undergrad assuming I wanted to be like a great rumba player and do a lot of orchestral stuff and do a lot of timpani stuff. And Lala will be the first person to tell you like, those aren't his strengths. You know, he's not, he's not, that's not what he does really, really well. He's great at teaching them, but you know, not for somebody who's at like the top edge of where his limit is. You know, and so what I realized at first, I was, you know, unhappy and I was, you know, trying to figure out ways to supplement that. And then I realized like, well, shit, you know, he's good at teaching these things. I should take advantage of these things. And that's when I started kind of uh, getting into the Latin percussion side of things and learning hand drums and learning all these other set of skills. And I mean, especially the business side of things like Lalo taught me more about kind of the music business and music industry from an artist standpoint um, than, than pretty much anybody. Um, and so that was really kind of helpful on the well-roundedness uh, within that. And then as I got to North Texas for my master's, um, I realized that even at a school like UNT, there weren't that many students that really had the strength in hand drums. As Ben will attest, there's not that many people at UNT that really dive into the hand drum stuff super well. Um, and so one of the things that got me a lot of the opportunities that I had at UNT was having those set of hand drum skills to go to and be able to walk into a group and just sound good right off the bat. Um, and so you got then somebody saw you do that and they call you for the next group and call you for the next group. Um, yeah, so I, I got to play add, like your chance, anyone's chances of playing drum set in the one o'clock or the two o'clock lab band at UNT are, I mean, slim to yeah. none. You've got to be a genius for that. But if you can play Congress, you can probably get on a recording session. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and that that was exactly it. I mean, I started playing with the two o'clock regularly. Um, and then that way, when the um, the thing with um, Lyle Mays, rest in peace, uh, came up, like I got to go play with the one o'clock with Lyle Mays, um, you know, because of just that hand, even though I was playing keyboards on that, it was my, my experience playing with all the, la the lab bands playing hand drums, hand drums uh, that kind of made that that opened that door for me within that. So hopefully that answers the question a little bit from there. Uh, there, there was a second part to that question that I know I didn't answer. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to jump to. How do you address these kinds of questions with your students? Yeah, so uh, I'm lucky that JSU um, is a undergrad only institution, um, at least for music. Um, and so I, I really am pretty firm that they're going to learn a lot of uh, a little about a lot, if that makes sense. Um, you know, so the, yes, we have a really strong keyboard curriculum. We have really strong snare drum curriculum, really strong timpani curriculum, and really strong drum set curriculum. But also, they have hand percussion lessons they have to take. They have technology lessons they have to take. They have an arranging lesson. Well, and some of these are more optional, but we recommend them because uh, they do run out of semesters at a certain point. But if the student is around enough, you know, 
all of those different types of things we pretty much expect them to do. Percussion ensemble, we try to pick pieces that are going to um, allow for a little bit more usage of that Latin percussion skill set. Uh, you know, pick pieces that allow for a lot of those kind of varied skill sets rather than all, only programming more contemporary percussion works that sometimes don't have some of those basics. Uh, represented within that. And a lot of that's because we have the undergrads. I'm not worried about putting on high art as much as I am teaching them skill sets to go out and be able to teach um, once they get out in the real world. It's one of the best gifts I think you, you can give them at the undergraduate level is just experience in a lot of different areas and then wherever they want to go from there, you know, basically if they're if they don't have knowledge or ability in an area it's not because they didn't learn how to do it you know it's because they decided that they wanted to go in a different direction yeah and that's the other thing and and my experience was like that as well and that like i really want the students to have a very broad undergraduate experience and as they go up in their degrees that's where the specialization can happen you know but make sure that they have a well round because they don't know what they don't know and so if you haven't exposed them to certain areas of music they're not going to know they want to specialize in it later um versus if all we did at the undergraduate level at jsu was play zanakis all the time they would never know that they liked steel band music you know, it's hard to tell uh, those kind of things. So I think that's the big thing for me is making sure you've, it's because a lot of our students are coming from rural Alabama where they barely know, you know, like high end music to begin with. Um, and so um, trying to train them and expose them to lots of repertoire, lots of things is going to open up their eyes to the things that are out there enough that, you know, we have students who want to go study, you know, uh, at Eastman and do kind of the crazy stuff they do and students who want to go to, you know, a kind of local schools um, that are a little bit more focused on general stuff. It just it just depends on um, what their experience is going through those curriculum things. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Matt. Casey, you have something for us today. I do. I have topic. It's my turn for topic. So uh, and actually, Matt, you just said, um, you know, high art. You know, teaching people high art versus like something that is utility in my head this is going to go basically to the place of like when we talk about what good is like when someone simply asks you like so is that any good i think a lot of times we may be having up to like four different conversations like you could be meaning good as several different things they could be meaning good as several different things but anyway the, the thing that caught my my ear and eyes this uh, these last couple of weeks is uh, something about the artist thomas kincaid some of you may know who that person is but if you google him you may find like headlines like the artist you've seen but maybe don't know and like i can almost guarantee you you've seen this person's art but this video on youtube the most hated artist you probably recognize and it's about thomas kincaid and uh yeah basically this is like a retrospective of uh, the, the criticism and controversy that's around this this artist and there's there's a lot of it like it's pretty good uh fun controversial trash tv to to, to watch i mean this video is you know i'm not saying his art is that I'm saying this vi this video is definitely like it's all the juicy stuff about his life and all the like fun controversy that's around it but again yeah i think catalog this kind of in the the topic of discussion not what is good but how we have the discussion of what is good so again i don't mean to like give you fuel to to decide oh i think this is better than that but rather like people could mean a lot of different things when they're talking about what is good so for instance like if you said casey is berlioz any good i could say yes and then if you say casey is berlioz like do you like berlioz i could say uh yes well i well with it's not a yes or no question. Yes, I like what he did for us. I like his contributions. Here's another question. Casey, do you enjoy listening to Berlioz? No. Casey, do you appreciate Berlioz? Yes, like those are all like different things. And anyway, I, th I think this this video that I shared with you all, like it, it, it kind of is a study in that based around um, this, this artist. So some of the quotes people say about this guy's art uh, that came up in the video and a lot of these are just like from the internet so and then others are actually published in reviews and uh, in, in real real places so uh, these paintings make my corneas hurt i'm ashamed that this artist lived in my former hometown it's worthless they make me want to puke they are false works they are awful simply awful it belongs in the trash it is stupid art for stupid people 
Oh, that's really mean. The worst paintings I've ever seen, and they'll haunt me for the next half of an hour. So yeah, it's pretty common that he was accused. He's passed away, by the way. Um, but he, he uh, accused of being uh, dishonest and damaging to art is something that is said. So I, I want to share with you um, just a few of Kincaid's paintings. Oh, and I even have sound effects for this. So this is, um, and again, this is not about like my or our opinions. This is about like a criticism he gets. So here's the first sound effect. There you go. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> here's the next one. There you go. <laughs> here's the next one. So anyway, you kind of, all right, that's enough of the, of the sound effects, but you probably kind of get the sense of like what, <laughs> what we're talking about and what people are, are looking at. And I thought it just kind of gives like a really good comparison for what, what we do see in music a lot of times. Like there is a lot of discussion around like what's good art, what's bad art. Um, and maybe I'll leave it right there for now. There's certainly more to say, but you guys watch this also. So I don't know. What do you do? You have any like immediate thoughts that came to mind about this little uh, focus on Kincaid's work? I do. I cannot believe there were 20,000 comments on this video that people are so outraged. You know, to me, it's like Kincaid is maybe kind of bland or not the most interesting, but like I, I don't I'm not sure that I understand the outrage and, and the energy towards hating it. So I think, and I think this about music too, I think people mistakenly think that if something that they find bad is occupying like the public sphere or uh, occupying the, the public market or whatever, that's taking away from what they are offering as if People think like, well, dang it, that 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 dang Lady Gaga exists, and only if music like that didn't exist, Stravinsky would get the popularity he deserves. And that's just not true. Like that's just stupid. Like that's just not uh, th that just can't be right. Like they think those are actually competing markets, and I just don't think so. Like I'm sorry, citation needed. Schoenberg would not rise to power if it just weren't for that damn Michael Jackson. Like that's just not true. And I don't like Thomas Kincaid either, but I, um, so here's, here's another uh, example. Like if I had to have, I'm actually more offended, I think by Andy Warhol than I am Thomas Kincaid. I would rather have an Andy Warhol in my room. Yeah, Ben, bring it on. That's fine. Um, like I would <laughs> rather, I would rather have an Andy Warhol to look at, but I'm more offended by what Andy Warhol did to art than I am what Thomas Kincaid did to art because I don't think Thomas Kincaid was, is stealing a domain or a market that wasn't already there, like that he that wasn't already taken up by that same type of artist. Whereas Andy Warhol is passing off. I, this is, I know I'm opening myself up for all sorts of targets and I'm, I'm ready, but Andy Warhol is like hijacking a whole genre of art that was once very serious. And it was about making statements about consumerism. And like, basically he made that statement once, like consumerism is, is obnoxious and disgusting and dizzying. And then he repeated that statement like a thousand times to put it very, uh, you know, a quick summary of it. Thomas Kincaid's basically doing the same thing. He's saying like, okay, there's this beautiful thing I like called like the light and the way, and it's amazing and all the heavenly glow of this, uh, perfect life or whatever. And then he's repeating that a thousand times, but that's not a genre that like, you know, quote, serious artists ever wanted to have. So he didn't take that away from art. It was already, I was already there. So they rant over. All right, Ben, what do you got? I think Ksenia's first. Ah. Thank you. Thank you Damn. Damn. Uh, for following the I wanted to, I wanted to warm up with Ben. <laughs> No, I'll actually, I'll be gentle. Number one, I would love to hear you elaborate a little bit more on Warhol and why you, why does that bother you that he stated the same thing over and over again? Because I don't think that that's his greatest contribution. I think the fact that he factorized um, existence of, of art and disseminated it in multitudes so that everyone could have access to it is a really interesting uh, thing to talk about. Secondly, I think that this video, um, 
described at the end had a wonderful conclusion saying, hey, this is like postcard art, which if we didn't have this, you know, they would just be white pieces of paper to send stuff on. And you can't put Francis Bacon on a postcard because you'd scare the living hell out of the person right. receiving it. So, you you know, it, it makes sense. And thirdly, I do think all of this is politicized because every time that we say something is stupid, like, it, you know, he should have died or whatever, because that's his aesthetic. We are trying to self-validate. We're trying to say, oh, we are above this. Look at the way we are. We are enlightened. We are smart. We know what's real. We don't associate ourselves with this. Whereas I think the conversation should be, do you like it or not? And that's it. Well, don't well, don't try to offend it to make yourself look better. Well, I think that's my one of my whole points is that when you say do you like it or not it's it's confusing because like there could be so many things it's like well do i appreciate what it's done for art um uh no not really because i don't think he ha he's helping art by doing this other than maybe inspiring a lot of young artists that has a lot of utility uh do i like it as in uh, do i appreciate it yeah like he's a good artist thomas kincaid has skill like he's certainly very skilled and that's that whole craft versus art thing that guy's a craftsman maybe he doesn't have anything to say but is he talented i mean of course he's talented you know i'd love to like one of these people criticizing him i'd love to say like hey let's let's see you paint any anything that even just realistic, you know, and, and I think one one of the things I've heard artists say about Andy Warhol, and I don't know a ton about Andy Warhol, I don't know if I should have put myself out there exposed to that. But like, um, but but like he is is one of several artists to make like, like everything is now art, you know, like, so hey, here's this paper clip. And that's my final thesis project. And like, it's a statement, it's, it's, it's statement overall, it's statement over craft. It's like, yeah, that statement's been done over and over and over. So I'm sorry, that's not your statement. It's like, well, it's original. Cause I'm like saying this is art. It's like, yeah, right. No one's done that with a paper clip yet, but that's been, that's actually, you know, like, so you can't judge craftsmanship anymore because everything that's easy is now at the same level as everything else. So it's interesting that like, and I think you're right. I agree. I think the author is, is standing up for Kincaid, you know, uh, in, in general. And I think I am too here, but that's like really, really a bizarre place that I think Andy Warhol amongst others, according to artists I've talked to have like put us in is like, well, now everything is just as valid as everything else. And statement matters as much as, everything else and it's like well well where are we but you you, you know I, I think some craftsmanship matters too you know or at least craftsmanship has to be in there and it's back to that old conversation of like look at matisse or dali or picasso i mean picasso stuff was always impressive but like look at the older stuff like they have they have like classical chops you know so I don't know. It's interesting. And again, I think it adds to that conversation of like, do you like it? That's all that should matter. It's like, well, what do you even mean by that? Like there's, there's so many dimensions of like, you know, and, and that that's interesting, you know? So it's like, don't, don't be afraid to answer uh, what sounds like a yes or no question with um, like extra um, um, codifying additions. What a great conversation started this all. <laughs> uh, I think that that I would sort of echo Casey's statement on like craft versus art, and uh, I think that to me the the sort of thesis that the speaker on this video was presenting, uh, I don't. In fact, he pretty much explicitly says, as far as I can recall, at least they, he doesn't think it's bad art. Uh, but when we look at art, there's often questions like who is saying it, why are they saying it? And those are the things that make it interesting. So I could write a piece that sounds like Nagoya Marimba's today, uh, but it wouldn't be all that interesting. But the fact that Steve Reich did it back when he did is what makes that piece interesting. Uh, I think the big explosive political topic about all of this was that when you look at the sort of lifestyle that Thomas Kincaid was portraying, he was maybe a bit of a hypocrite and this article or the video loosely talked on how he would take advantage of gallery owners and basically you had to buy so much art that you couldn't sell and he preached you know the pure sort of christian life and overdosed at 52 or 54 something like that on alcohol and valium mm -hmm. and so to me that's where it gets sort of like a little bit slimy um, and that really has nothing to do with the art itself so much as the statements that he was trying to make but i will in his defense say um to just go back to my little baking thing that we talked about originally <laughs> uh 
how many people start baking by making like a gigantic, you know, professional grade wedding cake? Like no one does that. Uh, most of us start baking with our mom when we're eight years old from a Duncan Hines box. And I wouldn't do that today with where I've gone with it, but there's nothing inherently wrong with it. And it kind of, we all have to start somewhere. And so how many little eight-year-old kids have stared at a Thomas Kincaid painting on their grandmother's wall and said, I wonder how he does that with the brush strokes and then have gone into studying art and maybe have even eventually turned on Thomas Kincaid, ironically. But so, yeah, and, and like, I think the point about like, so if we're not going to put Thomas Kincaid on postcards, like what, what do we put on postcards or what do we make puzzles out of? It seems like it would be kind of like sacrilegious to make a print of the Mona Lisa, cut it up and make a puzzle out of it. So I don't know. Uh, that's my two cents on it. I, I don't find his art offensive at all. I just think his his message was maybe a little bit slimy, but that has nothing to do with the quality of his artwork. Yeah. yeah I, I, one of the interesting things about an artist like that um, is to me, I, so when I was first getting into the kind of contemporary percussion music side of things, um, I remember seeing a video by Mark Applebaum that I thought was the dumbest thing I had ever seen in my entire life. I thought I it was it. super, super dumb. And a lot of it's because I came to it from the perspective of like, this is not music. It's just you moving your hands around. Which one? Like, uh, it was probably aphasia, I think at this point. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, but, but I, I remember seeing that the first time, and this was a long time ago. I remember seeing it the first time. I was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. You're not playing any notes. Um, and then, um, you know, ignoring my my evolution with with that piece specifically, but uh, Mark Applebaum has an amazing TED talk if you haven't seen it. Um, and one of the things that he preaches in the TED talk is this idea of um, the question isn't is it music, and in this case, I would say the Kincaid is it art. You know, the question is is it interesting. You know, and I think that that's really the only question that matters. If people find it interesting, you know, and I think your your paperclip example, Casey, is a good example. It's like not many people are going to find that interesting. It doesn't matter what the artist has decided it's going to be. What matters is the kind of culturally derived meaning of what they're going to interpret it as. Um, and I think that um, once you kind of reframe things into that perspective, like I'm not worried about whether Ken Cade's a good artist, a bad artist. If people like it and they find it interesting, then that's enough for what that is uh, within there. And there's also a great article. I, I wish I remembered the author. It might have been Warren and, um, that was about the idea of art versus entertainment um, and kind of the balance between that. Um, you know, and, and when we talk about music, you think about pop music versus classical music and all of this. Um, and the idea that they serve two different roles. And to me, I would argue that the Kincaid side of things is more of the uh, entertainment version of painting. It's the one that, you know, like you're saying, you can walk up in, you know, I remember seeing Kincaid for the first time hanging out in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, kind of a little, you know, mountain village touristy area. And you walk in and you look at it and you're like, oh, that's really cool. But like, I was never going to buy one. It really served an entertainment value for me of walking in and being like, that's a pretty painting. That's a pretty painting. All right, cool. I'm going to go walk to the uh, old timey photo shop instead. You know, um, so I, I think that there's a little bit of a balance uh, to me when I look at that, that do I consider it high art? No, but even if the technique's really good, I still don't see it high art, just like with pop music. You can be entertainment focused pop music still with amazing production value and amazing performances, but it's still pop music and still focus on entertainment rather than art. Uh, so I, to me, I think that Kincaid kind of falls into more of that entertainment style art um rather than more yeah. um something that's making you think a lot it's kind of very surface level but on purpose well that's why i'm i think one of my whole points here is i, I think we run out of words too fast because you know like you just said there's pop music and then there's art but i i know you don't that's not the end of what you're saying because like right. is pop music sometimes art i mean of course yes of course it's art right. You know, of course, it's all art, but 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 we kind of need more vocabulary to describe this. Because if I tell uh, someone not in our circle, like, "Oh yeah, Lady Gaga is not art" or something, they'd be like, well, "What do you mean? Of course, it's art." You know, it's like, yes, it is. It's not doing the same thing <laughs> that like yeah. like like Stravinsky was trying to do. But th but I, again, like, I think I, I just want to like emphasize my point. I don't think they're competing. You know, and, and right. I think all these people attacking Kincaid and again I don't like these paintings at all but I think they're they're just misinformed it's just like or or people attacking folks in our field of like saying like oh you're you're belittling the whole genre you're bringing it down to the level of 
um, kitsch is the word that was used. You know, you're bringing it down to the level of cheap kitsch music. It's just like, I, I, okay, I mean, I, I agree they are, but that's not taking away from the quote high art because they're not even like they're not competitors, you know. I agree with you there, Casey. It's not, it, it's not it's not that one is in competition with the other and you know one's yeah. it's not even that it's better or worse or anything and matt i i want to jump on to what you were saying too just with like there is a place for popular art and popular culture you know like i was thinking about some parallels in different fields with this like romance novels that are probably super cheesy and i don't read them but lots of people do you know like you like people are reading these books paperbacks on the beach and like some popular music is just like you know really basic doesn't really say that much but people like it and they listen to it and know all the words or or like you know there's kind of like trashy food or tv shows or things that like there's there's a place for it and i don't think it makes it any less authentic or less i don't know less yeah. good it, like it's just what people want well i think even in like my own life like i listen to and i crave pop music and our and classical music just to keep things simple like i crave those at different quantities and like one doesn't eat away at the other like they, they might occupy the same activity time but like i need a, a specific quantity of each to feel like satiated by each by each one and they don't overlap like like cat, cattle decapitation the band doesn't do the same thing that um that's right matt <laughs> <laughs> that's the first one for me yeah um, that doesn't do yeah that's a real band then they don't do the same thing for me as beethoven does you know like the, and this is that's okay like they're not supposed to you know yeah I, it's well, one thing that's really funny. Like I have always not liked his art, even when I was a little kid, I saw it and it was just kind of like, whoa, you know, and I, I don't know what it is about it. I mean, this kind of made me think about like, yeah, like, like why, 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 why would you hate that? Is or, it or the why? rainbows and the Cinderella and the puppy <laughs> and the <laughs> gold? It, it's like, I don't know. I don't know. It made me really think like, yeah, how is the sun everywhere all at once or something? Or like, like the the i don't know the same light is everywhere all at the same time or like i i don't know what it is but um like the, the descriptors they use they they do uh they do make sense like yeah it does seem like um i don't know tacky which i guess they called kitsch in the in the uh in the movie well, if you like cow murderers, the band, then this stuff, which is like happy, doesn't seem like your cup of tea for pop. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if like you could totally turn around and find a lot of meaning, like with his whole personal life and like his whole, you know, what led up to his death and like his life of like excess and arguably criminal activity or at least questionable criminal perhaps questionable criminal activity like i don't know like you you could and like he he got caught peeing on a, 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 we need a, a mickey mouse <laughs> you know he peed on urinated on a mickey mouse in public or whatever and and it's it's like you know and, and supposedly said this one's for you walt like I don't know, like you could probably make a case for like, actually, this is like, I don't know, a good example of an artist like really longing to be someone different or trying so hard to like, you know, whatever he, he said, his paintings like, you know, conveyed the light of God or like had the light of God in them all the time. And I don't know, it's like, I, f I wouldn't be shocked if one day like we look back at these and like, okay, you know, we have something to say contextually about them with his life. Cause like some composers, they're, their work is really or some of their works are really specifically tied to their like biography and their biography moments is like at this time in this person's life this is like so much more interesting if you know that so i don't know i wouldn't be shocked if that's how this like uh, i don't know is, is looked at even now you know well said have you guys had enough i was just wondering should we try to invite some of these thomas kincaid haters on the podcast <laughs> I think yeah, probably could take like lots of episodes i i have a feeling they're all like college art students so probably not <laughs> probably. but like you don't yeah actually like you a crossfire thing 
you don't hear many professionals like like you notice we all kind of have the same tone about this like none of us is like virulently against it we're all kind of like ah it's not my cup of tea but hey a lot of stuff's not my cup of tea like professionals in general like have that outlook about everything like artists in that professional artists have that outlook about it so i don't know like i guess i'll just say to young people like if you're hearing this about a musician or an artist you're probably just hearing a bunch of a bunch of like young insecure idiots you know and like um yeah but like it, it's it's rare that anyone significant is like like really loud about this it certainly happens but it's i don't know it's it's pretty rare and like here you just heard five uh, people, at least in like the professional academic sphere, and we're all just like, hey, relax, you know. All right, I yield my time. I yield all right, my all right. The, gen <laughs> the gentleman yields. <laughs> well, Matt, I did. Thanks, Casey. Um, thanks for that discussion. I did want to ask you, I know that you played quite a bit with Nashville Symphony when you were up there in Tennessee. Um, would you share a few highlights with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the cool things is I, I kind of grew up around that orchestra, um, you know, again, with my uncle kind of being uh, the tuba player in the symphony, like um, one of the things that would happen pretty regularly, we have a pretty small family um, here in Nashville. Um, so we would hang out uh, with my uncle and everything for like Thanksgiving, Christmas and all the symphony players that uh, didn't have close family that were in town would come over. So like I was always hanging out with symphony players, not necessarily percussionists, just kind of, you know, string players and trumpet players, things like that uh, from the time I was pretty young. Um, so I was kind of always around the orchestra. I, um, uh, I actually even studied with Bill Wiggins, who at the time was the timpanist for the orchestra uh, in high school. Um, so I got to go sit on stage and kind of check things out um, within that. Um, so once I kind of finally got back into Nashville um, after my doctorate, um, I ended up starting to play with them a little bit, um, which was which was cool. So Sam Baco started calling me. But um, uh, this is always my favorite, you know, joke is uh, the first thing I got called for was a Legend of Zelda concert. Um, and I, uh, I, I actually told them when I got there that I had practiced for 30 years for that concert. I was totally ready, <laughs> totally ready to play that gig. You knew the, um, you knew the tunes. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you know, I seriously walked in. Um, and it was it was just such a comfortable place to jump into because it was one of the pops concerts with a click track. You know, I was playing music I was already familiar with and had been for years. Um, and it was playing more kind of multi percussion kind of things. So that was pretty cool. Um, so as I kind of did that, I started to get called more and more um, ended up probably fourth on the list uh, where I was get playing pretty much, you know, every other week, every two or three weeks, something like that. Um, so one of the, my highlight stories from playing with Nashville uh, was an accident. It was a Christmas concert, maybe 2017 in that range. Um, and uh, f with Nashville for the Christmas concert series, they'll split into two orchestras. They'll have uh, one orchestra doing Nutcracker, one orchestra doing more kind of Christmas pops and all those type of things, all the Home Alone film score, like you name it. Um, and so, um, when they split, they only have two full time percussionists, uh, Sam Baco and Rich Graber. Uh, so Sam would be principal of one, Rich would be principal of the other one. Um, and S Sam's kind of mainly the kind of the more drum guy and Rich is mainly the more keyboard guy in terms of what their normal assignments are. Um, so I ended up getting put with uh, Sam on the kind of more pops orchestra stuff. Um, and one of the things that came up was this uh, Jeff Tyzik. I think he's the conductor, one of the conductors of the Rochester Philharmonic. Um, but uh, it was a Christmas pops concert, nothing crazy. Um, and Sam had just asked me if I was cool playing all the keyboard stuff for that concert. I was like, yeah, that's fine. He said, there'll be a few little xylophone parts that are kind of hard, but nothing super crazy. Um, and those of you who have, you know, done gigs with kind of or most regular orchestras, you're going to get the music at most like two weeks before, you know, you'll, you'll maybe get it. You'll have two weeks to kind of shred it out before the first rehearsal. Um, well, the, the rehearsal for this, the very first rehearsal was a Wednesday, um, was a Wednesday afternoon with a Wednesday night concert. So it was like one rehearsal and you're, you're in it. Um, and that was the week after PASIC. So I had picked up my music right before I went to PASIC. And since I was working at Pearl at the time, I, I essentially was leaving for PASIC on Monday. So I picked up my music on like the Saturday or Sunday, kind of looked at it enough to see what see what it was. There was one one particular piece that had a, a lot more xylophone notes, but it still seemed relatively manageable. But it was a lot of xylophone notes. Um, so got home from PASIC on Sunday. I was exhausted, you know, kind of pulled some music out, practiced a little bit, you know, kind of started learning that hard xylophone part. Um, you know, kind of finally got to the point where I could play it all and feel comfortable going into Wednesday. 
uh, walked into the first rehearsal and the personal manager walks up completely white faced and says, uh, the conductor has just informed us that the xylophone is going to be on the front of the stage for this piece. You're playing a concerto. And we didn't know that. Um, so the orchestra was completely unaware that this was happening. So I'm a substitute that ended up playing five nights of a concerto with the orchestra. Wow. Uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> and, and, and like I found out the morning of the concert. Um, and so, you know, I, I had practiced this part for like three days and felt comfortable to play it, but I didn't feel concerto soloist in front of the orchestra comfortable. Um, I, I mean, so wow. I played, I played it fine, but it was like, they even gave me, because there's really good union kind of representation, um, and things like that in Nashville. And so they actually came to my, you know, came behind me and said, like, if you don't feel comfortable doing this, we'll just take this piece off the concert. Totally fine. Um, but I was like, no, I, I'm not going to get this opportunity to do this again. Like, let's, let's freaking do it. Um, so I just really kind of had to um, just shred a lot, but I, I didn't even have a, a tux with a white jacket. I was going to go pick that up. So after my rehearsal, instead of shredding a bunch, I had to go pick up my white tux jacket from somewhere, like got to the concert just in time, just like not even think about the nerves and just kind of did it. Um, so yeah, so I did five nights of a concerto performance with the symphony as a substitute player, which they would have never, ever done if they knew that it was going to be a concerto. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, that was, you know, it's one of those stories that you kind of like always joke about, like you had in a bad dream and it actually happened to me. You know, there, there is a more nightmarish story than that. Uh, oh, and no. it was a few years ago, I, I guess there, there's a story on classic S, excuse me, classic FM. If you just Google uh, pianist learn wrong concerto, <laughs> there's a pianist, uh, I'm probably going to butcher the name, but Maria Joao Perez. Yeah, uh, cool. And she was scheduled to play a Mozart concerto and she went out on stage to play it. It was a lunchtime concert. I guess there was no rehearsal. Uh, she went on stage to play it and the orchestra started playing and it was the wrong Mozart concerto. <laughs> <laughs> and she had played whatever they were playing years before and she just played it from memory perfectly on the spot without having practiced it. It's nuts. <laughs> I just I can't. It's imagine a cool how... video because you, when you know what's going on, you watch her face. Yeah, you see her face kind of <laughs> for a moment she react, and she just does it. Yeah, it's cool. I can't top that story, but I did have a somewhat similar situation once playing a like pops concert, bunch of movie music, and uh, found out like a day or two before the first rehearsal that one of the parts was escapades, and so that was um, that was a fun week. But it wasn't playing a, a concerto with the Nashville Symphony. You you also had a really special film score recording uh, <laughs> experience yeah. in Nashville, right? Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. So one of the cool things is a lot of the uh, kind of film score and video game soundtrack work has started to move to Nashville because, um, you know, there's amazing orchestral players there. And also the studio scene is super, super good from all the kind of country rock recording. Um, so there's been a lot more kind of movement of, of that to Nashville. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, so my very first film score I played on was really, really excited about. Got called, and they, they don't tell you what you're going to go play on beforehand. It's just like, hey, you're going to come play a film score. You know, these are the dates, these are the times. So I got there, and it's like, okay, cool. My very first film score I'm going to play on ever. This is going to be fun. Um, ended up playing My Little Pony, the movie. Um, so my very first movie I was on was My Little Pony, the movie. Nobody can take that away from me, so... <laughs> that's very special i didn't actually know that there was a my little pony the movie i didn't either until i recorded the soundtracks for it <laughs> were there nice parts oh, i was fine i mean it was normal kind of uh soundtrack -y. i played bass drum parts on it so it was normal kind of soundtrack bass drum parts nothing special but yeah if you are uh interested in watching my little pony the movie the bass drum playing is me so. it's good to know <laughs> <laughs> i pretty much moved to, to jacksonville right after that so i didn't have a chance to do much more than that um but yeah that was a, a fun first uh, film score my my only like claim to fame for the play the concerto on no notice was uh i showed up to a tv and movie gig and we played the simpsons theme and i got to play xylophone on it which is a cool book <laughs> 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 and very easy uh no um well matt i just had one one kind of silly question to ask uh, I remember at UNT going to, I can't remember if it was your recital or Matt Filosa's recital, but you played a trio that had more instruments on the recital stage than I've ever seen in my entire life. 
Um, and uh, I think you guys actually had to like book like an extra time slot just to set up for that. Could you could you tell us about what that piece was? Yeah, it was a it was a percussion trio piece that Matt Filosa had written. I think he called it Eligua. It was uh, kind of based on some Bata uh, ideas and concepts, but it was pretty three pretty heavy percussion uh, setups. Um, I mean, I, I don't remember enough about it. That was a long time ago now. Um, but yeah, lots and lots and lots and lots. I think most of us had 20 plus instruments. I had something like eight or nine toms and concert <laughs> set of two songs and all sorts of things. So, uh, but yeah, I don't remember much about that. So I like the hats, y'all. I've practiced from studio class. Um, in the in the chat, it was commented that Ksenia and I are very serious with these hats. Yeah. <laughs> I've yeah. gotten angry at students with this pirate outfit on. <laughs> <laughs> not really, not too angry. Well, did you use a pirate voice? <laughs> they should. <have. laughs> it's hard to take you seriously, Casey, when you're not in pirate voice. Got to be in character. <laughs> ben, did you have something else? No, I just wanted to ask about what that piece was. It was, it was like a ridiculous amount of instruments on stage. It was a cool piece too. <laughs> Well, I put in the chat if it was more instruments than Dressor. Had to work that in at some point. In this. I would say yes. <laughs> the, it was the, big, the, the biggest instrument debacle I've ever had is um, it was a Crum concert. And Crum writes for a lot of percussion, but they programmed various Crum songs from various different song cycles. So it'd be one thing if we did like one entire set of songs, they use like all the same percussion instruments or at least like a reasonable amount. But when you play like two pieces from this set, one piece from that set, and another piece from that set, it was like we each we each just kind of had everything. It was really, really silly. I'll Obviously not programmed by a percussionist. No, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah. Enabled by a percussionist, an enabler. Yeah, it was definitely needed to just say like, dude, you gotta, you gotta say no to that. It's dumb. Well, Matt, I think the, the only remaining um, social media topic for us today is two of the friends of the show um, brought this up. <laughs> I already know where it's going. <laughs> I know. Our buddy, our buddy Tracy Wiggins said he is looking forward to an entire percussion podcast about Teslas. And I think you actually only mentioned a Tesla once. Um, so, you know, congratulations. Um, and then, and then our friend Brian Nosny also wrote, does owning a Tesla make you better than the rest of us? Which I think we all already know the answer to, but. Yes, of, co of course is the yeah. answer. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, in, in all practicality, how does it work for, you know, gigging and, and, you know, things like as a, as a working musician, it works fine. I imagine. Yeah. Can I answer, well, can I answer that? Yeah, go for it you roll up in a tesla and they're like hey where are your timpani and you just go like i don't think this concert needs timpani where's my check <laughs> and that's it <laughs> yeah that's, not, that's how you're right but uh but no actually it's uh there's tons of space and so um you know i can easily fit a five octave in in the, the sedan and i actually just ended up getting a model y which is why everyone's harassing me about it um but uh so the model y i mean i can fit easily um more more stuff than I had in my Honda CRV, um, pretty pretty comfortably. So, um, yeah, I, I can fit a set of four timpani. I have the Revolution drums that kind of the basses and bowls separate. Um, so yeah, it's it's quite practical. That's the reason I reason I got it. And man, I've saved so much money on gas. That's the main reason I got mine. Um, when I first started the JSU job, we lived an hour and fifteen minutes away from school. Um, so I was driving, you know, two and a half hours a day, five days a week. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it 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 added up very quickly. So, yeah, well, I'm I'm with you. I have my trusty Prius that I've been driving for eight years now, and I cannot I mean, I can fit more than most people think I can put my marimba one in it, but I can't move timpani and that's OK. I actually I like having a limit that there's there's only so much I can bring um, and yeah, save a lot of money on gas. Oh, yeah. Tons. So there you have it. The Tesla does um, does make Matt better than the rest of us. <laughs> Until more people join the ranks. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great to meet you virtually and get to chat with you and hope to see you in person soon. Maybe a PASIC. Yeah, in November, it sounds like. Yeah, sure hope so. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. Matt. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.